in the third week of this retreat and so you should try to reaffirm your vow of noble silence make that vow again because it tends to slip has everyone made that vow? So that's in your consciousness now, you've, you've determined not to seek other people out to talk and chat. In regards to the Gulf, cry, Gulf War, just don't, uh, don't talk about it, just don't uh, just observe this, the mind, you want to reflect on the kind of curiosity, desire to know. Some of you I hear have great little radios you listen to, determined not to listen anymore to the radios. Is everyone determined not to listen to the radio? Because this is a rare chance here to not feed the mind with that kind of energy and information I'll keep you informed of the necessary things on the Gulf. Just because I listen to the radio doesn't mean you can. <laughs> I didn't listen to the radio for 20 years at all. So, I mean, most of you still have very worldly in habits and worldly inclinations, so that kind of thing, you, want, you, you don't want to feed it and, and uh, keep it ap active. This is, retreat's a chance for reflection, contemplation of Dhamma. For us, the Gulf War is Dhamma then we're getting to the cause of the Gulf War by watching what goes on in your mind. Uh, because the Gulf War is a result of avicca ignorance of the truth. So if you're, if you're still uh, acting and living and, did, and just carrying on out of ignorance, then you're contributing to the Gulf War. You're know, making your contributions to ignorance and wars. This is, remember I've been saying this Gulf War is a result, resultant karma of humanity. The resultant karma of, of the Arabs, the Iraqis, the Kuwaitis, the Saudis, the Israelis, of the Americans, of the British. The British that, that kind of cut the boundaries around Kuwait and Iraq and all that. British karma, it's American karma, Israeli karma, it's all this karma of the Soviet Union. It's, we're all, we're all contributed to this slaughter and this, this kind of thing that's happening. So just don't go around thinking it's Saddam Hussein's fault or be heavy on the United States or the Israelis or anything else. It's all just, we're all part of that. It's the human, the result of human ignorance, greed, hatred and delusion. So you're reflecting on it as Dhamma and you can see how many of your own thoughts and tendencies are just ignorant just habits of prejudices and biases and, and uh, things that you, that were instilled in you. We didn't have that much choice. A lot of emotional states and attitudes and reactions, uh, not that we chose to be like this, it's just the way we've been conditioned. So, the refuge is in knowing the condition is a condition rather than 
identifying with the conditions, being absorbed into the conditions, being deluded by the conditions. So silence, giving up the radio, newspapers, don't read those things. Determination to, to practice, but don't make practice into a burdensome thing. That's why I've been been trying to encourage this 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 watching of of the intention what it's like to get this compulsive tendency of having to do something or practice is a I've got to practice compulsive obsessive tendency of the mind you want to identify it and see it so practice doesn't become another uh, compulsive activity for you so you you can see this retreat as a as a kind of holiday, as a way of of being able to be light and happy and and to be able to reflect on Dhamma. Free your mind, free your heart from all its fetters and bondage. And we have opportunities now, like with, with uh, Heather, to try to help her. She's going through a difficult phase. This has been very English. <laughs> <laughs> Having a few problems. <laughs> now, what is the reaction to that? Is it, is it, to how do you feel? Is she, is she, interfering with your retreat, or is she uh, troublesome? Are you frightened of such kind of behavior, or, or uh, do you just? wish it would stop and wish it wouldn't be like that or feel confused or frustrated or what just to notice what happens to your mind when when the, these things happen around us to us now we can make our intention our intention now now notice I emphasize the word intention Because this is not uh, uh, telling you what you should, c sh how you should feel about everything. I'm not saying what you ha how you should feel. I'm just trying to encourage you to in make an intention, which is to, to on a rational plane, beyond feeling. Uh, I emphasize rationality doesn't feel anything. It's totally unfeeling. So you use it for intention. And so intention means to, to intend towards, uh, say, compassion, metta, serving, uh, helping someone of our community who needs help. Make that the, a rational intention. Then observe, you know, during this retreat, what you what you feel like emotionally in regards to that? Uh, just to observe the the reactions you might have of feeling annoyed or bothered or or um, guilty. Maybe you feel guilty because you don't feel uh, maybe very compassionate, or maybe you don't feel the way you should think you should feel, or whatever complicated mental creations you have. Observe. Reflect on it as Dhamma. Notice it. Begin to see it as an object, as a condition of the mind. 
So notice, I'm not trying to intimidate and say you should feel all the time tremendous metta and compassion and just ooze all kinds of kindness out and, and, uh, and become a bit silly about it all. I'm not asking you to, to try to become uh, compassionate, but you're, you, you intend with the rational mind, with the ability to create ideals, you, you form that intention as a rational thing, as a guide, as a direction, how to deal with this, with this situation that has ar arisen. Do the best you can on the action, on uh, what you know, and, but observe. Admit into your consciousness the way you're actually feeling about it. But not as a personal uh, kind of testimonial or confession to anything, but just a recognition of this is feeling. Feeling is like this. If you feel threatened or frightened of a person like that, then then feeling is like this. This is a feeling, an emotional feeling. Or if you feel uh, impatient or or you like don't want to be bothered, that's a feeling. Sense of not wanting to be bothered with with something like that, not wanting to have to to give up sitting time or interfere with your practices. That sense of not of somebody getting in the way or feeling annoyed. Really notice what that feels like. So we're taking a situation like this and, and, and using it for enlightened understanding, for liberation, for Buddha seeing Dhamma, rather than seeing it as an impediment or a bother uh, and believing it. Believing that a retreat, a proper meditation retreat, there shouldn't have any of these kind of things going on. We should we just want everybody to sit still practice hard, nobody break down, nobody crack up, nobody create any problems, everybody here on time, everybody, it's like how ideal retreat, you know, where, where there nothing goes wrong, everything goes right. Everybody says at the end, what a wonderful retreat. Everything was right, nothing went wrong. That's the ideal retreat. That's an ideal retreat. Retreat is like this. This is the way it is. Life is like this. Life feels like this. Yeah. Being born as a human being and feeling, I mean, consciousness and feeling is like this. You feel things all the time. Breathing and Consciousness, eye consciousness, ears, nose, tongue, body, manovinyana consciousness, like this. Gulf, Gulf War also. War is exciting, isn't it? Is a fascinating war, exciting war. I mean, it's a real macho war for men. It's really brings out that that brute in us. <laughs> we get these kind of phallic airplanes zooming over <laughs> rockets and highly powered. Uh, Rockets, kind of cruise missiles, going off ships in the Persian Gulf and kind of wending their way through the streets of Baghdad into these various buildings that they demolish. It's like science fiction. 
you can see the generals they kind of took it as this was really men fighting a battle and women too and why <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, you know, just watching the mind from the way my mind is, watching the war is exciting. It's a very exciting thing. This is an exciting war. Excitement is very compelling, isn't it? It's mesmerizing. It's totally absorbing. It's anything exciting, you're just it, caught right into it. It's irresistible to be excited. Because you don't have to. Uh, you, you're absorbed. Excitement is an energy that you're just taken in. You don't have to do anything. To, to resist excitement takes effort, but to just follow it is just the easiest thing in the world. So this is the way it is. Excitement is like this. War and violence. Uh, weaponry. And all this uh, atrocity. Uh, we find yourself really interested in, in uh, what the kind of gory details are of war. Now, idealistically, we might be very much against this war and, <coughs> and think it's, you know, we, as an ideal, we, we might feel, our idealistic mind might think it's a, a terrible thing that's happening. And all these people being killed and, and destruction and violence and hatred and all these forces just going wild. That's the ideal mind. That's the, that's the ideal, wanting, wanting, you know, seeing uh, how terrible it is. But yet, one can still feel that I'm the same excitement. But there's also a feeling of anguish. And it's depressing also a feeling of sadness that we behave like this, that human beings are, do these things. That we can just be so willing to, to destroy and to, to just not take and respect life at all or the planet we're living on and just, just delight and become fascinated in the excitement of weapons and, and wars. And, Taking revenge, Saddam Hussein is a super villain. More hateable man is hard to find. Uh, it's even you can't even feel sympathy for. I mean, Ho Chi Minh, at least you know you, you felt sympathy for. It. Maybe he's probably a decent human human being who was trying to free his country from all the problems the Europeans created and the Americans. Ho Chi Minh wasn't the villain. But Saddam Hussein, no matter how hard you try to, to uh, you know, kind of whitewash him, he comes out black. <laughs> so that gives <laughs> that that gives you even it's, it's clearer. You know, it's a very simple thing. It's, it's more black and white than the Vietnam War. So these different feelings we can have in regards to what's happening there. Maybe we just don't want to know about it. Don't tell me anything about it. I don't want to know anything. 
I just don't, not interested and I don't want to know these terrible things. But life is like this. It's, it's not a judgment or a cynical statement or being fatalistic. It's just a reflection. Life is this way, isn't it? It's feeling and consciousness. Being human is like this. We, we're quite capable of doing the most brutal and horrible things to each other as well as the most loving and kind and compassionate. We have such a range of possibilities, behavior, in our lifetimes, we're all subjected to various levels of uh, brutality and sensitivity, love and hate, kindness, compassion, greed, hatred and delusion. Retreats also bring up boredom, and having to sit and walk and walk John Grom, and that can be to many of you is very boring. Or it brings up maybe unwanted feelings. Maybe just get very negative, or uh, but uh, so that the. Uh, if, you, if you're not terribly disciplined or haven't been on retreats very much, then one can just follow restlessness, go down to the farm shop, eat a lot of cheese and chocolates, things like this. So try to restrain and develop that sense of restraint, not a kind of... Uh, suppression of feeling, but to recognize uh, how much we, you know, when we get bored, how much we want to seek some kind of sensory uh, indulgence, want to have uh, some kind of sensory pleasures, distract ourselves with food or sweets or the radio or the newspapers or the talking with other people or planning or doing things, you know, around the, the monastery, wanting to, to make plans for the future, whatever. So this is to be observed, that you want to see this, what the mind tends to do when faced with retreat time. <clears throat> Where there's the morning puja, bell rings at four, and I say, get up leap out of bed with alacrity. Throw out your chests and say, wonderful new day is beginning for me. And then bow to the Buddha three times. Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Do your 5BX. Get ready for the uh, morning puja. Brush your teeth. And then Try to get over to the meditation hall before five o'clock. See if you can be here before I do. So that you're not just kind of running in at the last minute or, you know, leaping out of bed at five to five with alacrity. <laughs> <laughs> So I, <laughs> that's, that's cheating. <laughs> it's easier to leap out of bed with alacrity at five to five than at four o'clock, I admit.
But then again to remind you that schedules are not, I don't want to institutional, I make you uh, 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 Pavlovian dogs, a song of Pavlovian dogs, that you go by the bell. The bell rings, you get up. <laughs> the bell rings, you go. <laughs> you just follow the bells and, the, and the, you become conditioned by the, by the schedule. I think use that. Use the schedule as a as a reference point. <clears throat> the aim is to is to try to work with a schedule so that you can say, get to the meditation hall maybe fifteen minutes before five. So you can get here and, and to be and sit and bow to the Buddha Rupa and kind of compose yourself. So the, uh, the ideal is is to not just just try to get in on time, just kind of last minute type of uh, behavior. Sometimes uh, things prevent us from getting here on time, so then we, we have to accept that, of not being able to. But our, we're not just kind of going through the motions or just following the schedule like a, uh, like a slave. We're not just Obey, or being blindly obedient. We're actually working with the schedule that we have, developing our life around the way that schedule is. Morning puja. <coughs> Determined to, to attend those every morning. Like it's our opportunity every morning to come together and, and to chant Re reflect on the three refuges and remind ourselves of why we're here and to meditate, reflect on Dhamma. This is coming from within you. You're internalizing this. This is, you're, rather than just obey, blindly obeying everything, because if you don't, you, know, people will, you feel people don't like you, or, or I will be upset, or people will uh, scold you, or you pe will think bad thoughts about you, and all that. That's, that's being o obeying because you're frightened. So you, you, you follow the schedule because you're afraid that if you don't, you'll be scolded or looked down on by us. That's one way of doing it. Fear conditioning. Why weren't you at the morning chanting? Heavy number, isn't it? I can be really heavy if I want. A good monk always attends the morning chanting. That means if you don't attend, you're not a good monk. <laughs> and then you, maybe so many lashes. The system of penances. How many bows, how many, like this, this Chinese bowing, how many of those you have to do if you don't make it? For every minute you you're late for the morning chanting, you have to do that many bows. That's one way of, of, uh, of keeping you going, isn't it? Through, through uh, punishing you for disobedience or not, not being on time or... But what, say, for the holy life, it, that, that, that's not what I want. I don't want you to, to just be another kind of uh, rat in a maze. But to, to take on this responsibility, to develop this sense of personal responsibility, to work with things, to reflect, to, to put yourself into this life, into this form, breathe into it, make it right for yourself, work with it, be honest and develop it so that 
something in you is really growing from within. It's not just, you know, winter's retreat, strict discipline, everybody has to come and everybody has to do this and if you don't, you, you're you going to be scolded or punished or or maybe we wouldn't do that, we're so nice here, but maybe, you know, you feel offended and you might feel Ajahn Sumedho's not very happy with the, your behavior and so you come so that you don't want to, to upset me. Or maybe you come because you want to impress me. You see, I'm always here. I don't, it's amazing. <laughs> the others don't get here on time, but I'm here. Loyal to the end. Mm. <laughs> so that, that is, that is uh, still not internalizing, is it? It's not, it's not really developing that and, and taking this life and making it work for yourself through, through wisdom and mindfulness. Don't think that this life, monastic life, is magical and suddenly you just kind of ordain and here you are and you just, through time, you just kind of magically transformed into, a, into an enlightened being. This, this form itself, this, this style, this, this convention, if you don't put energy into it, it's dead. The, the life of the Sangha is your life, your energy. It, sangha has no life, no energy of its own. It's a convention only. So it depends on you to bring it to life, to, to breathe life into it like into monastic life. Make, breathe your energy, put your energy into this form of the, of the samana. Rather than just kind of go through the motions uh, and uh, follow your, uh, your old habits and then just kind of conform, blindly conform to a system. is not the purpose of this life. One feels with the masters and monks that I've really respected, like Lung Po Chao, that he was very much, he'd, he'd made it work. He brought this vitality and this radiant into monastic life in, in Thailand. Why do you think we, we, we Westerners were so fascinated by him? He wasn't just a kind of spiritless, dreary old monk. They just happened to ordain and was afraid to disrobe and just went through the through the, the system. But he actually he actually had was there is a, a radiant vitality there in this form. It was a monastic life had this quality. It was was it was uh, compelling inspiring. Now the, the monk monastic life, as I've been encouraging you to, to it's a form, it's a classical form. It's the traditional form, and therefore, it's it's a form that we use for reflection, not for attachment. It's not to become something of mine. It is to we have to understand the use of form, of convention, of vinaya. We have to realize how to use these forms, these rules, these conventions for reflecting, to be able to see Dhamma, to, to be able to 
see our own habit tendencies, the way we tend to, the way we are conditioned, the way our mind tends to operate, our emotions react, and what, what sets us off, what upsets us, what, where we feel lazy, where we feel depressed, where we feel greedy, what we find uh, makes us angry, or we feel, uh, have aversion. Mm. So you're within the limitation, restraint of Vinaya. You, you're determined to stay within that fence, that boundary of Vinaya, so that you can observe. And like, like determining to, to not eat in the afternoon or to be restrained is, is not just to suppress, not just trying to suppress your desires, but to intend your, your, make that intention, set the limits so in a conscious way, so you know the limits are this. These are the limits for action and speech. They're this way. So you're, the, in this, your rational mind, you're, you're bringing into consciousness the limits that you're using. This is the, this is the, 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 the templum. This is the boundary. Because the templum, isn't it, was a Latin word meaning the place to go for contemplation. So say the, the in other words, it was a play, a temple was a place that you go, a designated area, a boundary where you go to contemplate the nature of life or the universe or the stars or whatever. So then in this, but the boundary was, was designated. It wasn't just uh, you know, any old place, any old where, it was, it was designated. A temple, a templum was a, was a plot designated for contemplation. The Vinaya is our temple, isn't it? It's, it's the, the limitation, the place, the boundary for reflection. Because we stay within that boundary in regards to action and speech. So we can observe. It makes life simple. If you, if you reflect on it in this way and, and appreciate this, then you, you can actually feel it as a simplification rather than a kind of, of asceticism where you're trying to restrain yourself and keep yourself from doing wicked or greedy things. And that's all based on the self-illusion. We're not trying to... to uh, restrain ourselves as a kind of punishment out of fear, but we are wisely establishing a boundary in order to contemplate truth, reflect on the way things are. So it's a simple, like a temple, templum was a simple place. It became a temple later where it became all very fancy and ornate and grand, but imagine the original ones were just probably like squares, small pieces of land that were designated for contemplation. So it's simplification. Simplifying life is, is, the, is the nature of Vinaya. Simplicity, fewness of needs, and from there, then we can watch the way the mind reacts, the wanting, not wanting, uh, fearing, desiring, greed, lust, anger and hatred, jealousy and envy, fear, desire, doubt and worry, anxiety, all these mental states are seen as Dhamma, the conditions, they're not, they're not, they're not what, they're not mine, they're not what I am. These mental states, they, they come and go in the mind, they're not, they're, they're, before I would identify with them, I feel angry, I feel lustful, I feel upset, that, so we, we, we establish an identity with these conditions, but in the templum, 
you're, you're not establishing a self-identity of anything. You can let go of all that and just observe the true nature of things. More and more subtle from the coarse, obvious conditions to the increasingly more subtle ones. Till every possible condition is recognized as what is subject to arising is subject to ceasing, a realization of cessation and of non-attachment, of desirelessness. So that's why in this life to, to use your intelligent, rational mind to bring into consciousness to learn to how to use this, this convention we have in the right way, then it works. It really works because it's based on, on truth, not on somebody's idea or an ideal or a doctrine. The Buddha pointed to dukkha then is the key, so that when you're really miserable and suffering, despairing, doubting, uncertain, upset, anguished, lamentation, grief, all of these, these are the, the uh, signs. These are what to understand, to, to recognize. To, to accept these feelings, to note them, to, to bear with them, to embrace them. I like the idea of embracing this mis misery. Where before, I, think, I hope nothing miserable happens to me because I can't stand it. That's how my conditioned mind works. I want to be happy. I want to have, have peaceful heart. I want to be loving. I want everything to go well. I don't want to have any, any hindrances or obstacles or offenses. I want everything to be nice. I want to be happy. I want to get enlightened. I don't want to suffer. So then, we experience all this soka pariteva, tuka tomanasa upayasa. I didn't ordain for this. I ordained it to be happy, get enlightened. But that's the conditioned mind, isn't it? Our conditioned mind wants to be happy, wants to get enlightened, wants to become something. So suffering is it's that most important thing to embrace it rather than to try to get rid of it. To embrace suffering means to Really accept it forever, as if it's going to be forever, and not mind it. Not mind it if it never stops. This attitude of, of just willingly learn from, from maybe eternal despair. Now that, that kind of reflection makes me see how, how my emotional emotions are. I want to get rid of it. I don't want this. I want, I want something else. And how impatient, restless, and uh, uh, the, my mind is conditioned to be restless and impatient with it all. And want to get rid of it immediately and take it all very personally and think there's something wrong with me or blame it on somebody else or get caught in all kinds of complicated reactions to it. But this sense of embracing something, understanding, standing under, uh, totally accepting it, as if it's going to be like this forevermore. Not making any deals like, I'll, em I'll embrace this suffering and then it'll go away. That's, that's, not, that's not patience, is it? You're just grabbing the idea of accepting and embracing hoping that you'll get rid of it. So your real intention is to get rid of it. 
rather than patiently accepting, bearing with, enduring, embracing, intentionally embracing it. That all the suffering in the whole universe I embrace. So then the when we accept something, then we can look at it. When we accept something and look at it, we can understand it. And when we understand something, we can let it go. But you can't let go of something you don't understand. You can suppress it, you can throw it, or try to get rid of it, but that's not letting go. Letting go is allowing it to go allowing it to be itself because conditions their nature is to come and then to go so you're not making it go you're allowing it you're letting it go rather than trying to get rid of it or trying to hang on to it So on this retreat, remember, we, we determined that everything that happens on this retreat is, is, is part of other retreats. Our intention in the beginning was to set up the retreat so that you had two months to reflect on Dhamma. And uh, where the lay people have come to offer their help on the level of supporting and, and uh, allowing this opportunity to you who have to who, who don't have uh, most of you have to have quite busy lives sometimes we, we don't have such opportunities we have to live a more active in <coughs> life with in here at Amaravati so this retreat two month retreats the lay people who come to to help and offer and serve and give and support. We've made our determination to use whatever happens as for our practice. That means the, everything going well or everything going wrong. It's, it's the, the retreat is like this the way it is. Nothing is a disruption or a disturbance to the retreat because all disruptions, all possible disruptions, disturbances have already been accepted as retreat. We set up the retreat so we'd have as few as possible because I didn't plan any, there's no planned disruptions or disturbances for you. I guarantee it. I'm not going. I'm not a Zen master. I'm not going to come in and start throwing your zafus and, at you and things like this, or doing things in any intentional way to cause a lot of disruption or confusion. But whatever happens, so the, the same intention is is this, this retreat where we we practice formal meditation, reflections on Dhamma for two months. And all that happens during the two months that, that is uh, with inside or outside, it comes to us from without, or the problems, difficulties, changing conditions that happen within the community here, or within ourselves. So the selfish heart thinks, I wanted a retreat and I, this is my time and I'm not getting enough time. And that kind of thing. That's a, that is a conditioned mind. That's a condition of the mind, isn't it? So if we recognize a condition as a condition, that is Buddha seeing Dhamma. So we really see Dhamma in 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 the way the way things are for us. So 
sometimes we get people coming to Amaravati, lay people who, you know, when they find out they have to work, they get quite upset. I didn't come here to wash dishes. I didn't wash dishes at home. I came here to meditate. That kind of, those kind of mental reactions are, uh, you know, quite it's from the conditioned mind. Washing dishes has nothing to do with Dhamma. Uh, sitting does. How many hours have you sat today? How many people ask me, how long can you sit, Ajahn Zamedo? How many hours can you sit still, not move? <laughs> I say, well, I prefer washing the dishes, actually. <laughs> so we can the, to reflect on these, these the, the conditioned mind. I, I didn't come here to wash the dishes. I came here to meditate. Or this two months retreat, I was planning it to be this way, and then this happens, and uh, you have to do this, and, and ruining my retreat. Rec- recognize this, 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 this kind of emotional reaction to, to. Uh, say things that you don't want to have happen. Because that's Dhamma. We're seeing where there's the Buddha contemplating Dhamma, knowing Dhamma. And life is like this. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's very pleasant and everything's ordered and everything's going well. Sometimes everything goes wrong. A lot of the times it's neither particularly one way or the other. But right now, it's this way. This is the way it is. Can you see it? The way it is right now. Can you notice attention to the way it is now? It's this way. You can't name it, this moment, can you? You don't, there's no, you can't say exactly what this is right now, but it's this way. on this retreat to relax and enjoy this retreat. Make it a a retreat that you that that you can feel at ease with, not just a ordeal or something you have to force. Some of you get so tense looking, you look you look like you you're going to explode. holding everything down, forcing, willing everything to... <sighs> willing makes... willing out of ignorance makes you really ugly to look at. <laughs> There's nothing uglier than somebody willing themselves out of ignorance, seeing it. So it looks like total misery. And that's not it. It ends up lightness and happiness and gladness, joy. If you're getting too serious about all this, then have a good laugh. Do something kind of to, to lighten yourself up and relax. Don't make meditation into this onerous kind of dead seriousness. Uh, Got to suffer to get enlightened. You, you, and so you, as soon as it, because that is, you know, the idea that suffering is the way to enlightenment, mindfulness is the way. So you, you learn through mindfulness how to, how to balance out where, rather than just just force misery onto yourself, increase your misery, your reflectiveness is sitting, sitting miserable and walking Jongrom, or 
Is it, do I just create misery around it? Notice the difference between actual thing. Like sitting, I find very pleasant. Sitting meditation, it's, it's joyful, a peaceful experience. I can make it into a, something I have to do and have to conquer, I have to get rid of pain and force myself to sit for an hour and not move and, and uh, you know, conquer the pain and defilements and, and using my will to do all this and after a while it, you just get so bunged up and so, so miserable in your mind, heart shuts down. So that's that's not gladdening the heart, not uplifting, and and the, the meditation practice is a way of gladdening the mind and contemplating the way things are. It's a way of of real uh, brightness and clarity and lightness of being. So when you when you, if you just go through the form and the and a kind of blind way and just kind of do everything because you're afraid, because maybe out of duty or obedience or fear or something out of the self, ignorance and self-view, then no matter how long you're a monk or a nun or how many hours you sit and how many places you, monasteries you go to, and how many teachers you've had, or had the best teachers in the world, or whatever, if you don't get it right, if you don't have the right understanding, then the whole thing is, is uh, it leads you to despair. The result of avicca is despair. Avicca bhajaya sankara and then from there that takes you to soka parite wa tuka tomanas upayasa jaramaranang soka parite wa tuka tomanasa upayasa misery ignorance conditions misery vicha is the way to liberation So I offer this for your reflection.